Welcome to the February 9th edition of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Oh, I hear glasses clinking. That must mean I need to kiss somebody, but there's nobody quite that close, but okay. Glasses clinking. Good afternoon, folks. All right. Is the mic? All right. I know the mic is hot, so. Hopefully the sound will get just a tiny little bit better as I talk. But, you know, there's some good news that I need to share with folks today about the forum as we continue on a new developmental track here. We had an individual who chooses to remain anonymous but is really, really big on public education and involvement in politics and issues offer a matching grant of up to $3,500 as we're looking at raising some funds to develop a speaker fund and perhaps a few other things. We have until the end of June 2015 to match as much as we can of that $3,500. For those of you that may not be aware, we are a 501c3 um, uh, organization, so there is such a thing as a credit on your taxes for a donation. Many of our members have given donations, and those people at home who aren't coming here and having good food at the pepper mill, that probably means you've saved just a tiny little bit of money that you need to be able to send to us. Ladies and gentlemen, we look forward to developing as much of that $3,500 as we can, and you'll be seeing some interesting things coming from the forum in the future. Folks, today we have an absolutely wonderful presentation in our continuing effort to bring important issues to the county and bring the county to those important issues. Today we have representatives of the Innocence Project. I have been telling people since I was a little child that I'm innocent, and I'm not sure how many people believe me. Today we're going to learn what can happen for people who have been wrongfully accused. It's my pleasure today to introduce Lisa Kaplan, Steve Wax, and Bobin Singh, all from the Innocence Project. Ladies and gentlemen, initially let us hear from Eliza Kaplan. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, I'm pretty loud to start off with. Well, thank you so much for having us today. And um, we are always happy to come anywhere and tell anybody about the Innocence Project. Project. We are a um, somewhat new organization. We officially launched last April after about almost a year of working to get us off the ground, fundraising and talking to lots of people and putting our systems in place. And so we launched last April. We started taking letters from prisoners in the summer. Um, our legal director, Steve Wax, who's going to speak after me, um, started um, in October. And so here we are just you know, a few months after that, and we are off to a really amazing first year. But before Steve talks to you about um, some of the projects that we're working on and issues that we're addressing, I thought I would take a couple minutes to let you know why I and a couple other people decided that we needed an innocence project here in Oregon. Um, so just a little bit about my background is I am a professor at the law school at Lewis and Clark. And prior to that, I am the founder of the New England Innocence Project back almost 15 years ago now. And I worked at the National Innocence Project, which is based in New York, which works in um, all 50 states. So um, coming to Oregon um, a bunch of years back, I knew I was coming somewhere that did not have an Innocence Project. And I had a lot of questions. Are you going to start an innocence project? Do we need an innocence project? And at first, I just felt like, well, I should just come and see what's happening here and learn more about criminal justice in Oregon. And I did that for a, a few years. And then after you know, sort of getting a little bit more into it, I realized that not only was Oregon um, one of the only states in the country without its own project, innocence project, or a similar program, that um, it was something that we really needed to bring here. So why is it so important to have an Innocence Project in Oregon and in every state around the country? Because I'll give you a very brief um, story of one of my past clients, and that should give you a little bit of an idea. Um, so I've worked in all of New England, obviously, and I've worked in most states around the country doing innocence work. And a lot of the stories are somewhat f similar. So the one I'm going to tell you is about one particular client of mine, Dennis, but um, his story has been repeated over and over again around the country. 
Um, Dennis was a military guy um, in uh, Middlesex County in uh, Massachusetts. And he was um, arrested in 1983 for um, two rapes and, a, and another sexual assault that he did not commit. He spent 18 and a half years in prison wrongfully. The victims in the case believe that the right person was behind bars. They made eyewitness identifications of Dennis at two different trials. And um, 18 plus years later, DNA proved that he did not commit either or any of these three crimes actually that he was in prison for. He was civilly committed during that time. He was in um, a facility that required him to admit his guilt, which he never did. He, for on his own for more than 10 years, was trying to break through the legal system to convince judges, to convince lawyers to convince everybody that he had not committed this, these crimes. And um, he was constantly denied, denied, denied. Every motion he filed, other people helped him file motions. He was constantly denied, denied, denied. Um, and that's when I was new and working at the New England Innocence Project. And we got all of Dennis's files. And we went through all of them. Um, and we believed in his innocence. There were so many inconsistencies, inconsistencies in his stories. There were, he was strictly convicted on these eyewitness identifications. And what we knew even back then in the early 2000s, and we know even more now, is that eyewitnesses often make mistakes. It's not bad intent, but it happens all the time. And in fact, there have been over 1,500 people who have been wrongfully convicted, imprisoned, and then exonerated. 325 of those were DNA cases, like the one I just described. In 72% of all of those DNA cases, someone made a mistake in identification. And obviously, when we make a mistake in identification and put someone like Dennis in prison wrongfully for all those years, the real perpetrator is out and committing more crimes, which is what we find in a lot of these cases. So why do we need an innocence project here in Oregon? Well, because um, we are not immune <laughs> from these problems. There have been, in fact, in Oregon, um, at least eight people who have been wrongfully convicted and imprisoned here due to all different reasons. Um, mistaken identification is one of them. False confessions is another one bad or invalid science, bad lawyering, overzealous prosecutors and police. These are what we've learned from these over 1,500 cases around the country is that this stuff happens all the time. Um, we've learned how it happens. We've learned why it happens. And there was no organization, independent organization, in Oregon where a prisoner or a family member of theirs could write. So if there's a dentist in prison, here in Oregon, there was n there's nowhere for that person to write or to ask for help. So we decided for, in Oregon, it was important that we, that we, were, we created this independent body where we could be that source, those lawyers for people in prison who are innocent and need help. So we set up shop and the letters are coming in from family members, from um, the prisoners themselves, from even some former law enforcement. We're getting letters, we are going through them. Steve will explain our process a little bit more. The other two things that we're focused on doing is working on different kinds of reforms and changing policies that, that are related to wrongful convictions. So for example, in the legislative session right now, we have, um, we have some changes to what we call the post-conviction DNA statute. This is a law that's been on the books in Oregon um, for about 14 years. And it's a mechanism that someone who has a claim that DNA might help them prove their innocence would bring a claim under this law to look at the DNA from their case and look at the DNA from, um, from um, the crime scene and everything if there's evidence exists and go through all of this and it could prove their innocence. Unfortunately, the law that we've had on the books has not been helping anybody because it's written um, very, very complicated, it's not up to speed, and it's not as fair as it should be. So we're working in the legislature right now to make some changes to that. 
We have a whole bunch of other interesting um, both legislative ideas for the future and lots of different projects. So we're, in addition to helping individual people, we also want to work to change the policies um, and different procedures that are, um, that are currently in place here in our state with regard to potential wrongful convictions. And then the third thing we do is we train um, and educate students. So law students, undergrad students get to work with us and learn about all of these um, issues in the criminal justice system. So that's who we are. As I said, we were founded less than a year ago. Um, and I'm, I'm going to pass the mic over to Steve, and he's going to tell us about more specifically about some of the projects that we're working on now. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eliza, and thank you for the invitation to come here and speak. I tried my first case 42 years ago. And after graduating from law school, working for a judicial law clerk, I spent the next four years prosecuting in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, quite an experience to see the nature of crime in that city, particularly the city as it existed uh, back in the 1970s. I moved from there upstate New York and ran a county public defender office before moving to Oregon in 1983 where I spent 31 years as the head of the Federal Public Defender Office here in this great state. About a year ago, I decided, uh, you know, I've probably had enough. Uh, maybe it's time to work a little bit less. Uh, getting a little sick and tired of dealing with uh, Congress and the uh, lunacy of the political situation. And decided, uh, well, maybe I should retire. And then, one day in February of 2014, I was at a bar function, and a young lady happened to be there who I didn't know, Ms. Kaplan. And we were just chit-chatting, and uh, I was telling her, well, maybe uh, I, I'm thinking of leaving the Federal Defender Office. And Eliza said, well, you know, Steve, we are setting up an innocence project, and uh, we're going to be looking for a legal director. And I said, oh, really? And the you know, conversation ended. We had dinner. And uh, next morning, I got an email. Eliza said, you serious uh, about retiring and about thinking about coming to work for the Innocence Project? Uh, about a month or so later, uh, we had worked out how I could retire from my full-time job, work less, which I wanted to do, and help get this project launched. And the reason why I wanted to do that and, and thought that it would be a good next chapter in my career was based on what I had seen in the last, at that point, 41 years. What I had seen about the justice system, how for the most part it is peopled by and run by people of goodwill. Defense attorneys, prosecutors, police officers, and judges all trying to do their best, but all being human and all of us making mistakes from time to time. Where I had seen people who were in prison, where I had represented people in prison who I believed were innocent in fact. Now, I recognize that uh, what I learned in my first year philosophy and religion class in college, lo those many years ago, about Plato and platonic forms of objective reality uh, don't have much to do with the reality of our lives. And things tend to be gray. Notwithstanding that, I am confident that there are people in prison who should not be there, and should not be there not just because the lawyer was ineffective, or the prosecutor may have withheld some evidence, or the police may have overreached in uh, searching, but should not be there because they just didn't do it. One of the more interesting cases that I dealt with here in Oregon 
involved a fellow who had confessed to a crime that he did not commit. We dealt with that in the Federal Defender Office. One of the statistics that Elisa did not mention is that approximately 25% of those 1,500 people who have been exonerated either confessed to the police or pled guilty. It's a reality. Why and how, you know, it's very difficult to understand in the abstract, but I've seen it. I experienced it. And I thought that it would be a good thing to spend a little time before I was finally ready to wind up uh, my working life, seeing if I could help both the individuals who are sitting in Oregon's prisons and do a little bit of policy work, which I could not do as a federal employee for the last 31 years, and get engaged in the political system and see if we can make some changes in the structures and processes that lead to wrongful convictions. All right, so what are we doing? Well, what the Innocence Project is doing so far is multifaceted, multifaceted and fascinating. Pardon the elision of those two words. I couldn't get past the fascinating part fast enough. As Eliza said, we have a legislative agenda and we started with the post-conviction DNA statute. It's been on the books for now 14 years, and it was not until this past August that a judge granted a motion for testing. There was one earlier motion granted about two years ago, which is being fought still. No testing has ever taken place under that statute. It was written by a biologist, very well-meaning person, but it doesn't work. So we're hoping to change and expand the scope of the legislative framework that allows people to go back to court to say, I'm innocent, and you know, there might actually be some DNA that can help exonerate me. We have engaged, uh, engaged. we have been very fortunate that two of the largest uh, law firms in uh, the metro area have volunteered some of the senior partners and associates to work with us on a forensic science project. Forensic science. The way in which law and science or law and medicine or law and psychology merge uh, is not always so easy. Ballistics, serology, blood spatter, metallurgy, accident reconstruction, things that are a little bit softer, shaken baby syndrome, child sex abuse syndrome. All sorts of experts are brought into the courtroom by prosecutors and defense attorneys to say, in my opinion, this or that piece of evidence is relevant to and points to the guilt of the person who's been accused. Now, the unfortunate reality is that some of that science, that forensic work, it's not science, it's junk science. And you don't have to take it from me. If you believe in our government, as I, for the most part, do, and you believe in our FBI, which I, for the most part, do, just read the FBI and National Institute of Science report of 2009 that talked about all of the junk in science that for decades throughout this country, state and federal courts was accepted and used to put people into prison. Well, these two big firms here in town, and they should be named, Perkins Coie and Markowitz Herbold, have been working with us on a study of forensic science in Oregon. What's going on here in this great state? What is the Oregon State Police Crime Laboratory doing? Are there any problems? We're looking for patterns. We're looking to see if there are people in prison who maybe there was a trial in Harney County, Maybe there was a trial in Coos Bay. Maybe there was a trial in Umatilla. And those separate counties, nobody knows what happened. But maybe there's the same issue that came up, or the same scientist at the crime lab, or technician at the crime lab, who was involved. 
and there's some problems there. We just don't know. And we need to find out because what our national government told us was that across the country, there are some real problems. And we need to know if we have that sort of problem here. Another thing that we've been doing is writing what are called amicus briefs. Amicus, good Latin word, friend. Friend of the court briefs. So there's a case pending uh, before the Oregon Supreme Court. And there are lawyers involved in the case. But the project comes in as a friend of the court to say, cutting through all the legalese, yo, judges, this is a real issue. Take a serious look, will you? And we've done that a number of times. We did that in a case involving eyewitness identification testimony. And I don't want to uh, you know, go off on a tangent and give you the first year law school course in eyewitness identification. But the short story is, back in the 1960s, based on a complete misunderstanding of the way in which memory works, the US Supreme Court wrote some cases on eyewitness identification. And it, they are abominations. They are inconsistent with reality. The Oregon Supreme Court, in a case called Lawson, Mr. Lawson, a fellow who was convicted and appealed, rewrote the law for this state a couple of years ago. And did so based primarily on the work of Professor Daniel Reesberg at Reed College, who is an internationally known expert in memory and identification. And the Oregon Innocence Project wrote an amicus brief. And we have written amicus briefs in some other cases following up on that one. So that's going on. We're also networking. We have been going to the district attorneys, to the police chiefs, to the victims groups. And we've been saying to them, folks, wrongful conviction is a community problem in need of a community solution. We are attempting to approach these issues from a neutral perspective. Yes, I spent most of my career as a defense attorney, but I remember my four years as a prosecutor. And I value the work of everyone in this system. And we're saying, as Eliza did, wrongful conviction is a community problem because if you've got the wrong guy in prison, the right guy is not there. And so we have been attempting to take a cooperative approach to the work that we're doing. Perhaps the last piece that uh, we're engaged in is responding to the cries for help from people in prison. So far, we've received more than 100 letters, most from the guys sitting in the state prisons, some from family members, a few from police and prosecutors, saying, not my case, of course, and I wrote it was about their cases, but saying, you know, I'm aware of this case that this other guy handled, and it's bothered me for a long time. Well, when we get those inquiries, whoever has sent it in, we send the fellows a 30-page questionnaire and there are all sorts of language and educational issues that we have to deal with because the unfortunate reality is that too many of the fellows in prison are either uneducated, undereducated, or mentally or intellectually challenged. But we send them a long questionnaire. Tell us what happened in your case. Tell us why you think you're innocent and what evidence might be out there. We've received back more than 70 completed questionnaires. And when they come in, we have a cadre of law students that Eliza and Bobbin are recruiting. And I got to say that one of the things I'm really enjoying about this work is working with those people I now call kids. Yeah. <laughs> of course, when I was 24, I wasn't a kid. I know that, right? Yeah. But these are kids. And they are so full of enthusiasm. Part of my job is to temper their enthusiasm, is to help them be grounded in the reality. Because what we need to do is to screen these requests for assistance and see, are the fellows who are asking for our help 
innocent in fact, back to my platonic forms, to the extent that one can prove that? And secondarily, is there anything that we can do for them? We've had a couple of inquiries so far that involve DNA. And we've brought a DNA expert in to take a look at the evidence in one of the cases. We have a couple of cases that involve some other forensic issues, and we have not yet engaged any forensic scientists, but we are figuring that out. We have a number of cases which are sex cases, which really boil down to the he said, she said, or he said, he said situation, where there are no forensics, because there was no, what we call in the business, a hot arrest. So there were no fluids that could be obtained, and there is no physical evidence. And how on earth do you attempt to show that this conviction was based on an untruth, a lie, and those are very difficult cases. But we have in hand right now two cases in which we believe that we have recantations from the people who presented themselves as victims. And those may be the first two cases that we end up going public with. Exceedingly difficult situations with all sorts of family issues and pressures brought to bear in terms of why and how the allegation was brought forward and then why and how in one instance nearly 30 years down the road a person says I can't live with myself anymore for what I said and did it was just not true and then we have to figure out can we do anything with that because the reality of both the state and federal law is it's really difficult to push those courtroom doors open again so far down the road if all you're saying is I'm innocent I mean we have a system that is in some ways perverse if you're innocent that ain't enough if you say my lawyer screwed me oh the judge will listen to you if you say the prosecutor hit evidence a judge will listen if you say I'm innocent the law may not allow the judge to listen to that and that's something that we will probably be working on for the Oregon legislature in 2017. We didn't try that piece this year. So we're rocking and rolling. The kids and I, we're having a ball. We've got a retired lawyer who was a public defender and then worked for the attorney general for 13 years, volunteering 20 hours a week with us. And she is totally into this and she's helping out. When we need to hire an investigator to go out in the field, and when we need to hire another DNA person, I got this first case for free. I said, hey, you know, the expert, I paid her a lot of money. The federal government paid her a lot of money, and I signed off on it when I was in the Federal Defender Office. Yeah, I didn't put it quite this crassly, but I said, basically, you owe me one. And she gave. But I can't go back to that well too often. So. Bobbin put on that table some cards that say, if anyone wants to donate money, now I'm not stepping over the line here, it ain't cheap what we're doing. And we operate on a shoestring. And I am the only paid employee. And I ain't paid well, and I ain't working full time. And that's between me and my wife and Bobbin, but that's all cool. But these are expensive, expensive cases. And so if you think that what we're doing is worthwhile, feel free to get a jump on your donations this tax year. <laughs> now, I should probably shut up, and we can take questions. Uh, if we have time left, I don't know what your schedule is. But uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah.
I think we'll have all three up here in just a moment to respond to questions. And boy, there's a lot of competition for the funds in this room. I can see that. Yeah. However, I would point out that as valuable as the Innocence Project is, I didn't hear anything about a matching grant, and we have a matching oh, grant. Ah, uh, well, now, see, <laughs> and does anybody else have another matching grant? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, before we take questions, please just a moment to remind you to thank our servers with, the, with whatever tip that you could do. The servers here are just so great the way they managed to get us our food without disrupting the speakers. They did that again today. So, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you for your presentation, Steve and Lisa. And I believe we have questions starting right now. I'll go and then call you up. I'm a, I can't even see you when you're asking. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Bill Kroger, a forum member. Hi. Thanks for coming in today. I think your project is an interesting one, and I'm glad you're here. I know a, <clears throat> I know a woman uh, who uh, uh, was a uh, uh, part-time school teacher. He was convicted a number of years ago of uh, sexually molesting one of her students, which totally blew me away because I knew her not really well, but enough to know that I just couldn't imagine her doing something like that. But anyway, uh, to make a long story short, they, f they finally threw the case out for various reasons. But I th thought how sad that is because, you know, she lost like three or four years of her life. I'm not sure she can get employment anymore. I mean, it just really screwed her life badly. Yeah. So I'm glad you guys are here. I think, I think the majority of people in prison are probably should be there, but, uh, but there are some cases where they need to be out. I have a question, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, my question is, is what criteria do you decide when you're ready to pick a case? Tell me a little bit about some of that. Okay, that's a great question. First of all, um, you know, we agree that most people in jail should be in jail. Um, and so, as Steve mentioned, our goal isn't just to try to trick the system or anything. Our goal is to find the people who are truly, you know, innocent and shouldn't be in, um, in the prisons, um, both because, as you just said about your friend, whether it's three years in trial and, never, you know, in or out of prison, her life is ruined. I mean, how, can it, how will she get a job, right? So imagine someone like the client I mentioned before, right? 18 years, he didn't do it. He had the newspaper articles, he had this DNA story, you know, and it's still, you know, it's really difficult whether it's, you know, you're just charged with something you didn't do or convicted or in prison. It's really very, very difficult to build your life back after that. So the cases we pick, well, as Steve mentioned, we, um, anyone who asks us for help, we send them a 30-page questionnaire. Um, and that actually is a lot of information. So if we get a questionnaire back that says something like, oh, I didn't pay my taxes and so I'm in jail or something like that, we, we're not going to take a case like that, right? So we know from that questionnaire, we can, we can cross off a lot of the no's. What we're looking for in cases are cases in that initial questionnaire, which then might require us doing more work, but our criteria is to, to, to see if, you know, we believe the person is innocent based, on, innocent based on what they've told us initially or with a little bit more research or investigation, which our students participate in as well. And what we're looking for are some of those causes that I mentioned before, the causes of wrongful convictions in, in these over 1,500 cases we've learned why people are wrongfully convicted. Because there's eyewitnesses who make mistakes. Because they sometimes falsely confess for various reasons, pressure, their age, their mental state, things like that. Because a type of science might have been used. For example, a type of science um, called microscopic hair analysis was a science that was created just for criminal law, right? So people became experts in this, but there's no science involved. And the FBI declared a few years ago, this is one of many, declared a few years ago that this was just a junk science. So every single case that was prosecuted with microscopic hair analysis done a certain way um, ha has to be looked at again. It doesn't mean the person's definitely innocent, but it means they were convicted using a bad science. And there have been numerous sciences invalidated by the FBI over years, and many that are, that are under consideration because they don't have a scientific basis. So we're looking for, for, for different science issues, or if there's problems in, a, in the crime lab, or something done with the science. 
Um, we're also looking at cases that might have some prosecutorial or police misconduct, bad behavior, or defense lawyer bad behavior. So when we get this questionnaire, we see what the person's claiming in this 30-page detailed questionnaire. We go back and we look at anything we can find about their cases, the briefs. Sometimes we speak to past attorneys, right? And then sometimes we might look at transcripts. And what we're looking for is, are any of these causes jumping out at us that make it worthwhile for us to continue investigating? And then another type of case are those straight DNA cases. Is there evidence from the person's case going back however long that if we can find it, if it exists, and we get subjected to DNA testing, that it might help us prove their innocence. So that's, those, are what, those are the things we're looking at. The cases are incredibly, incredibly time consuming. Um, you know, we want to be sure. <laughs> so we go through a lot, a lot, a lot of research and investigation before we will even commit to taking a case. I hope that answers. Thank you, Stephen. Hi. Oh, go ahead, Stephen. You want to add? Yeah, the, the one thing I want to add is when a person writes in, that person is not at that moment our client. And we have devised the term uh, inquirer. So we're getting people in prison inquiring, making a request. And we then go through this lengthy process before we decide to actually take someone on as a client. and. To date, we have not yet taken on any clients. I think we're close in a couple of cases, but we have not yet said yes to anyone. And we have said no so far to somewhere between 12 and 15 people where we've done our investigation and have said this is not a case uh, that we can take on, either because there just wasn't sufficient evidence of innocence, or there's nothing that can be done uh, for the person. Thanks again. Mark Freiberg, Forum Member. Could you comment on the role the plea bargaining process has in this, given it is absolutely fundamental and routine, yet provides tremendous incentives for some innocent people to plead guilty, given perhaps a circumstantial case? Plea bargaining, uh, again, we could spend an entire semester talking about it if we were in law school. Um, as I said, roughly 25% of the people who are currently on the uh, registry of exonerees in, in the country either confessed to the police or pled guilty. The way our system is structured, it has given, in my judgment, undue power to prosecutors to set charges, and once they've set the charge, mandatory minimum sentences and mandatory sentencing policies, either through statute or guidelines, have tied the hands of the either elected or appointed judges so that they have minimal to no discretion. The last habeas corpus case that I handled in the Federal Defender Office was a case that resolved based on a plea of guilty to a manslaughter charge so that the person could avoid a sentence of life imprisonment that she was facing on a murder charge. Within a year or so after getting into prison, she said, you know, for two years I fought this, for two years I worked with my lawyers gearing up for trial, and the pressure that was brought to bear on me at the 11th hour I should not have succumbed to. Federal Defender Office was assigned to represent her six years into her sentence, and we received an 81-page opinion from Federal Judge Malcolm Marsh in uh, the spring of last year, in which he concluded that we had established, we, the Federal Defender Office, had established enough evidence of her actual innocence so that he was able to overcome all the procedural barriers and grant relief. Plea bargaining is a problem. Even more significant, if you're interested in this as a policy matter, are the mandatory sentencing laws and the shifting of discretion from what I think we would all see as more seasoned people who sit on the bench and wear black robes with more life experience 
than the young assistant district attorneys who are now able to impose sentence by the charges that they're permitted to bring. If you want to get into a policy thing, don't try to eliminate plea bargaining. That ain't going to go anywhere, but address this sentencing issue. <clears throat> Yeah, hi, John Tyner, for a member. I'd like to thank Bobkin for the um, amicus brief on State versus Prieto Rubio. We argued that on the Supreme Court on Wednesday, so thank you very much for that. Um, but more than that, I was attorney for um, um, an individual, uh, Vern Pavlicek, in the 80s, one of seven or eight um, people convicted of murder who were later, the, the convictions were reversed, except for hers, because of course the habeas statute um, didn't allow actual innocence, so she was actually released, but you had Sergio Morales, you had Boots and Proctor down in Eugene, you had um, Sosnovsky and um, Pavlin up, up here. It was actually Mike Rose who got the um, post-conviction reaction. Yeah. But what I'm saying, what I'm gonna ask you is, um, how much effort do you think it's gonna take in 2017 to, uh, to get actual innocence in the statute? And I'd offer my assistance at this time since I've been fighting for a long time, but. It's, it was it left in quorum, the quorum, quorum nomus was abolished in the 50s and never came back in the statute. Um, well, first, um, the, some of the cases that you mentioned, um, for people who are interested, there have been, as I mentioned before, about eight, about eight, there could be more, there was no innocence project sort of keeping track of this stuff, but approximately eight people have been, that were wrongfully convicted, have been exonerated here in Oregon over the years without an innocence project, and you can read about each of them, including, um, it sounds like your case. Um, yes, yes. Um, and the two people that were wrongfully um, convicted in that case initially. Um, on our website, there's a lot of information about each of those stories um, to document them. You know, it's hard to know, obviously, anything with the legislature. It's really hard to know how anything might turn out um, now or later and, uh, you know, a um, more serious uh, election year versus not election year. And I guess, you know, we have a sort of on our list a number of legislative items that we hope to accomplish in the future. Um, when exactly, we're not sure. We have sort of a running list. And part of how we make that decision is we're looking around the country at what has been successful, um, what is needed in states that have had an innocence project longer and have been doing this work longer than us. Um, and there's also, besides legislative ideas, there's also court ways you know, to address some of these issues too. So I would say that um, finding a mechanism for actual innocence is on our agenda in some form. Um, whether it's legislative or in the courts, um, you know, we're not exactly sure. We have, to, we have to sort of see how things go as we move forward with cases and people start to see our work um, and, that and, and that we can prove more and more that people do um, get wrongfully convicted here in Oregon. Um, with that said, you know, um, I would say, you know, keep watching us for all this stuff. What we really need on any legislative item, this session on the PCDNA law and also in the future, is we need support from the public. And then I'll also say that so far it feels like innocence is an issue that all sides can get, a, get a, sort of wrap their brains around and want to work on. So, um, you know, whether that's political parties or prosecutors and defense lawyers, so far we've had a really, really great reception in all these different arenas where people want to make exceptions and want to, um, you know, ensure that there are not innocent people in jail. So that's not a, that much of a direct answer because it's kind of far away for us to know exactly what our agenda will be, but certainly a mechanism for actual innocence is on our agenda in some form. Patrick Wheeler, former member, Hi. with what's been going on in this country lately, what's your opinion on the grand jury system in this country? Good and bad. The theory of the grand jury was an absolutely wonderful invention back in the 1700s. And thank God that the founding fathers, there were no founding mothers because of the way the country operated back then, uh, saw fit to include uh, the requirement of indictment in the Bill of Rights. Grand jury, in reality, has uh, devolved in many respects into a rubber stamp, into a creature of the prosecution, rather than the independent body that it was intended to be 
to stand between the citizen and the king, the citizen and the president or prosecutor, and to make independent judgments and hold the prosecution in check. I was not present, none of us were present, I assume, in Ferguson or in Staten Island to see what actually happened in any one of those police citizen encounters that did not lead to indictment. I assume none of us were present here in Oregon in any of the uh, encounters in which uh, Portland police or other law enforcement officers uh, shot either black people or mentally ill people. There's no question that to be a police officer is an incredibly difficult, dangerous, and complex job. And we are fortunate that for the most part we have people of goodwill with good judgment making snap decisions. On the other hand, if you look at the pattern of shootings and the pattern of prosecutions or lack thereof, one can see that a disproportionate number of people who are shot by law enforcement officers are people of uh, non-European ancestry. I'll just put it that way. And one can also see that the number of police officers who are prosecuted for the uh, acts that they have undertaken is far, far smaller than what one might think. Now, any individual case, I can't make a comment on it. Looking at the pattern, it seems to me that we should be concerned. And there are a couple of things that we can do about it. Here in Oregon, this legislative session, there is a bill pending to record grand jury proceedings. I hope some of you are shocked to learn that under the state law, as it exists today, there is no requirement of a stenographer or a recording device. And most grand jury proceedings in this state are not recorded. My judgment, that's wrong. I grew up as a prosecutor and a public defender back in New York. All grand jury proceedings are recorded. And I got to review those transcripts. Judges got to review the transcripts, and judges got to say on occasion, yo, Mr. Prosecutor, you did not present this case fairly. When you read the transcripts of what took place in the grand jury in Ferguson, it seems to me uh, some of the commentary that I've read suggesting that the prosecutor did not, in a fair and unbiased way, treat the witnesses may have a point. Bill pending, take a look at it. Let's have the proceedings recorded so that a judge can review them. Another thing that I think is important is to recognize the need for some independent prosecutorial activity in the grand jury. Why did the local DA in Ferguson, with a personal history of a relative being shot, you know, a police citizen encounter, present that case. Why didn't the governor step in and appoint an independent person? And part of our system here seems to me we have to deal with both fairness and the perception of fairness. Perception of fairness, bring in an independent person to present a case to the grand jury. Two things specific. I will get off my soapbox. <laughs> Next question. Okay. Uh, I'm Lee Coleman, forum member. Question is, what degree of cooperation are you getting from the Attorney General and uh, the Oregon Department of Justice? This is, after all, a law and order issue, yeah. and it's costing taxpayers lots of money to keep people in uh, good health, clothing, housing, at great expense. What cooperation are you getting from the Attorney General? Great, um, good question. So I'll expand your question even and include, you know, um, all the people that we're working with sort of in the same vein. So 
Um, the, we're working with the Attorney General's Office, we're working with the Chiefs of Police, we're working um, with DAs. Um, for us, starting an Innocence Project at this point, um, unlike, you know, there was some disadvantages because we're getting into the game kind of late, but some of the advantages is that we don't have like a history of fighting about stuff, you know, we can come in now when we know that, everyone knows wrongful convictions happens, right? There was no, when I started doing this work, um, you know, in 2000 in Boston, and I mentioned DNA, and I mentioned wrongful convictions in court, on the street, to a friend, people looked at me like I was crazy, right? And here we are 15 years later, and this is something we all know. We open the paper, we see these stories, right? We have CNN on, we see these stories of people coming out of jail after all these years. So wrongful convictions are a known thing everywhere in this country. So now when we go to the AG's office, to the AG herself, when we go to different DAs, when we speak with police and law enforcement, people are incredibly open to hearing what we're working on. They're incredibly open to finding ways to collaborate. Um, so far, um, I can give you a couple examples of how the AG has um, worked with us. Um, well, first and foremost, been incredibly open to, you know, door open to, to us, you know, that we exist. Um, Steve had a, some personal conversations with the Attorney General on a particular case, and she was very open to hearing them. Um, in some of the post-conviction DNA law, we met with um, you know, the person who's head of their legislative um, section, and he gave us a ton of input on our legislation and, you know, made suggestions and offered to show it to people. So, so far, we feel like there's a lot of collaboration. And we're, I'm currently working with the chiefs of police and to, for, um, for an event we're going to have in Salem um, on eyewitness identification in May. So I'm working directly, I get on phone calls, it's like 10 chiefs of police and me, right? And they're totally into bringing these issues to other law enforcement, to DAs, to legislators. They really want people to understand this issue. It affects their day to day. They want to get it right. Um, and we, as um, Steve mentioned, we spoke at the winter conference for the District Attorney Association. They welcomed us. They Many individual DAs have told us, please call me if, I, if you have a case in my jurisdiction. I don't, you know, I want to know if a mistake was made. So, you know, how an individual case will play out in court, we're going to fight, I'm sure, on a lot of them. I'm not going to say it's all going to be beautiful and we're all going to agree. But that's one thing to fight in court um, on an individual case. It's another thing to find ways to work together and collaborate. Um, you know, again, when, when someone is wrongfully convicted, it costs money, right? The wrong person is, uh, is out there, in most cases, committing similar crimes. So this is a win-win. Innocence is a win-win for everybody. Um, and that is the message that we're sending. And so far, you know, we haven't even been open a year, but so far the response has been, um, you know, really, really good. Harry Bodine, former member. <clears throat> In my working career as a newspaper reporter, I spent a lot of time around the courts in Hillsborough and Multnomah County, too. Uh, and I've served on three juries. And <clears throat> the, uh, uh, the last one went, involved a, uh, a, an assault case, two brothers against another person. Uh, uh, they all happened to be Hispanic. Everybody was under oath, and there was, everybody was perjuring themselves right, left, and on the stand because they knew they could kill up, they got left the courthouse if they, you know, they fingered the wrong person. This is just one example, but I guess my question would be this, that one time I was having a conversation with Michael McGilligan, who was a circuit judge out here, and he said, you know, juries, sometimes juries uh, will make a mistake, but he says, probably 99 times out of 100, they'll figure out who's telling the truth, and they'll, they'll, they'll figure out what the, the facts are, and they'll come in with the right decision. Your comment. I agree. You know, uh, one of the things, uh, perhaps about me, maybe I'm a little bit Pollyanna-ish, but after all these years, I still believe in this system of ours. I have uh, studied some uh, legal systems and justice systems around the world, and 
my view of this is, whatever the imperfections uh, that we have in this country, uh, I'd rather be on trial here uh, than just about any place else. I have also had the privilege of serving on three juries, three criminal juries. Uh, you know, sometimes people are like, what, the DA's left you on? Yeah, the DA's left me on. And yeah, I voted to do justice. And in a couple of instances, that meant to convict the guy. I believe in the system. It's imperfect. And I have seen jurors go off the rails. And I have seen juries where I just want to wring their necks because there is no way that rational beings could have reached the result that they did. But I think that's the exception. And if in 99 times out of 100, they can see through you know, the, the mass of perjurers, if that's what it is, and, and decide, nah, we should really believe this guy, well, that's a pretty good percentage. But that's also why we need the Innocence Project, for that one out of 100 times when they get it wrong and where there might be something to do to right that wrong later on. That's why we're here. Chris Leslie, former member, I'm glad you're both here. It's a real pleasure to have you. My question is, Steve, you mentioned patterns. Is there a pattern of innocence denied? Uh, could you have a ranking of innocence denied? Sloppy police work, sloppy courts, whatever. I think that when Eliza went through the five or six different reasons why uh, innocent people are convicted, uh, you know, she identified, uh, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the core ones. And we've had a problem with junk science, and that problem with junk science uh, is probably uh, you know, near the top of the list. And we've had a problem with eyewitness identification. I mean, the legal system just got it wrong. And it used to be, and the Supreme Court said, if a person gets up and says, that's the person, and I'm 100% sure that that statement of certainty was to be credited and a jury was to be instructed, well, if the person says the person is certain, then the person is certain. And that is just inconsistent with what is now known through reasonably scientific study goes on in human minds. So that's probably uh, the best answer I can give, yeah. and, and Eliza seems to be agreeing. The only thing I would add is that what you see in a lot of these cases is a combination yes. of things. So you might see a case where someone was convicted on, you know, some faulty form of science, right, and uh, an identification. And back to the jury point, well, you know, those things are convincing, right? When a person's on the stand and says, that's the person, and it's the victim, that's the person who raped me, that's the person who did whatever, it's, is it really a jury's fault? I mean. Who wouldn't believe that, a first-hand um, you know, identification like that? You combine that with any other thing, and it's a slam dunk case, right? Um, so you see in a lot of these cases, they have more than one. And then they have a bad defense lawyer who didn't you know, cross-examine the witness properly or at all, didn't do any investigation or didn't, you know. So a lot, a lot of the cases I've seen in my 15 years or so doing this have been a combination. Um, but, but if you look at the numbers, the two leading causes of wrongful convictions are eyewitness misidentification and either invalid or improper science. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Phil Nelson, forum member. and. Uh, without getting into issues uh, regarding Guantanamo Bay, where I understand we don't have a judicial system, frankly. Uh, I am wondering, in uh, the cases that you're working through and public support is building, perhaps, uh, to influence the, the concerns about the death penalty, and perhaps you could address that in Oregon as well as nationally, and if what you're doing is moving the conversation uh, in the death penalty arena. Thank you. The Innocence Project is a project of the Oregon Justice Resource Center. 
the executive director of the Oregon Justice Resource Center is Mr. Singh. One of the projects of the Oregon Justice Resource Center involves the death penalty, and there is a movement uh, afoot here in Oregon to revisit the, the death penalty, and Bobbin and the OJRC are very much involved in that. With respect to the Innocence Project, uh, I can speak as a private person and say that I think that it uh, would be a very good thing if Bobbin was successful. Uh, the Innocence Project, you know, our focus is on innocence. We are looking at a couple of death penalty cases, and one of the cases that we have had some informal involvement in and may end up in a more formal role is a case with a fellow sitting on death row. If as and when we get more immersed in that case, I'm confident that the Innocence Project will be saying some things uh, about the death penalty uh, that are in all likelihood quite consistent with what the OJRC is saying. I'll just add that, you know, when you do innocence work, your work isn't about for or against the death penalty. But I'm going to say this personally, but also beyond personally, I have helped, um, you know, numerous people around this country who are wrongfully convicted for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, death row, walk out the door innocent from these prisons. And once you have any involvement with that, there is no way you can believe in the death penalty being a good thing because that means that a whole bunch of my clients could have been dead or in some states that I worked in there was no death penalty but they had life sentences. So um, while we don't take a stand officially on the death penalty, we kind of don't have to because um, you know, as long as we know that our, that our system makes mistakes all the time, um, that we are looking at a death penalty case, or we might in the future if we continue to have it in this state, then, you know, it kind of doesn't jive with our work, right? I mean, our work is to get innocent people out of jail. Um, what, you know, whether they've been there for one year, 20 years, they're on death row or not. So um, while we might not take a stand, it's kind of, um, really, really difficult to think that there's anything positive of, about the death penalty when a, a whole bunch of my clients wouldn't be living their lives right now and with their families um, if, um, you know, if they were executed. So, and we didn't have a chance to prove them innocent. Let, let me make one more comment because it goes back to the question that was asked about plea bargaining. One of the very, very difficult conversations that I've had with one of the fellows who has inquired from prison and asked for help is, do you really want our help? It's a fellow who was accused of an aggravated murder, was offered a plea, and after an agonizing time, after an 11-day hearing, on the admissibility and value and accuracy of some DNA testing. He decided to take the deal for 10 years to avoid the possibility of a death sentence. And then he says, as did my client from the Federal Defender Office, why did I do this? I don't want to go through life with this conviction. I didn't do it. And I had to say to him, before we undertake any work on your case, you need to sit down and revisit your thought process and why you decided about a year and a half ago to enter a plea for a 10-year sentence. Because if you go forward and if we win, death is back on the table. I don't yet have an answer from him. John Hutzler, forum member. Um, I, I understand your efforts to, uh, uh, to obtain cooperation from all segments of the justice system, and, and it's also clear that, that you're being very careful about how you select cases. I suspect uh, perhaps even more so with your first cases. Um, uh, could you comment on, on how important it is in, in your decision 
to, ex to accept a case or to, to go forward with a case, um, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to have or feel that you can obtain the cooperation of, for example, the prosecutor or the police involved um, uh, before proceeding on to, to uh, contest it in court. We would like to obtain cooperation. That is not going to be a deciding factor, nor do I anticipate it will be a significant factor. We're going to have to make a judgment, as a Supreme Court justice said about pornography a number of decades ago. Can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And we're looking at innocence. I don't know that I can define it. I don't know that I can quantify it. But I think we'll know it when we see it or when we feel it. And then we're going to act. And we will go to the prosecutor and we will say, let us join hands and reason together. And if they say no, that's life. We'll fight. Nothing to add. <laughs> Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation.